my name is Katrina Hodge. Um, I am a junior tenant at uh, Five Essex Court uh, Chambers. Um, we specialise in uh, policing, uh, public law and um, employment law. Um, but obviously today I'm going to focus primarily on the um, public law practice that we have in Chambers um, that, that I do, um, but also the policing aspect as well, because a lot of the policing work is, uh, is very much uh, a public law practice as well. Um, so one of the things I've been asked to um, discuss with you very briefly is what attracted me um, to the bar, and particularly this area of law. Um, and I think there's probably um, three things I would uh, cover briefly. One is um, the uh, individual responsibility that you have as a barrister. And what, what I mean by that is that when you receive a set of instructions, um, either to um, prepare your um, grounds of challenge or your grounds of resistance, in, in, say in a judicial review context, um, your um, sister who conduct, has conducted the case and, and has analysed it will set out their views as to the points that they want to, uh, you to take uh, on behalf of their client. Now, as a barrister, you've got to form your own view as to whether or not you think all of those points are properly arguable or whether there are other points that you need to take. And that's a decision that rests with you and you have that responsibility. And of course, you advise your client uh, accordingly. So. I think that's where I think there's a big attraction in that you, you have that role um, to take the lead uh, and to advise your client um, on that basis. Um, the second area that I think perhaps most obviously distinguishes um, the, the, the role of a barrister from that um, of a solicitor is, is the advocacy that you uh, will be required uh, to do. And in the area of public law, what's quite unusual um, about your role as an advocate uh, is that you're very, very much focused on uh, legal argument. This isn't an area of law which is characterised uh, or dominated by technical expertise in large part, and it's not an area where ordinarily you'd have a very complex, complex um, factual matrix that would emerge from reams and reams of um, disclosure. Um, instead, it's an area where really um, you're, you're kind of grappling with the uh, legal framework, whether that's statutory or common law principles, um, and burying into the case law to determine um, whether or not uh, the particular facts of this case uh, fall, meet those principles, meet the conditions for a challenge, uh, or whether they can properly be um, distinguished. So um, from my point of view, that was one of the big attractions. Um, it's, it is quite unlike other areas of the bar. Um, you don't, by and large, have any cross-examination um, in G JR, albeit that it is creeping in in certain areas. Um, but, but for the most part, really, it's just based on witness statements that are prepared uh, and will be taken um, as uh, a read. And, uh, and of course, it, it, it's very unlike a, a criminal practice where you would have jury speeches and, and a very much dif very different style of advocacy. Um, you are simply uh, presenting your case to a either a single judge or, as it may be, two judges in the administrative court. Um, and so, obviously, you adopt a very different style to, to the one you would if you were in front of uh, a jury, for example. Um, and then the third uh, point, I suppose, which is very much overlapped with the legal argument, um, what really attracted me to this particular area of law, but also the role um, as a barrister, is the intellectual stimulation that you have uh, by virtue of the fact that you're very much dealing with legal principles um, as opposed to, as I said, a, a much more complex factual matrix. And from my point of view, um, that, that attraction really was on the basis that as a law student, you research, you, you, you develop your learning and understanding of the law, um, but you very much carry that forward uh, as a barrister. You're constantly uh, learning public law as an enormously diverse area of law. Um, and uh, so you, you, you are constantly developing uh, your knowledge, and I think that's, that's very stimulating uh, and exciting. Um, in terms of the areas of practice that you might encounter as a public lawyer, um, I think I'll probably deal with the ones that are, I've certainly had experience, and I know that other panellists uh, will be able to talk to you about their different areas of practice. Um, but we um, at Five Minutes Court do a lot of work uh, in immigration and policing, um, and just to cite an example, um, last week the Supreme Court were dealing uh, with uh, the case of MM Lebanon, uh, which was uh, a challenge to the immigration rules and the introduction of a minimum uh, threshold of income for any British citizen or resident who wants to bring a non-EU spouse or partner into the UK. Um, so that challenge has gone all the way uh, to the Supreme Court as to whether or not those rules are Article 8 uh, compliant. We obviously don't know yet uh, what position they're going to take, but that's really just an illustration of what uh, you might, at the very height of your practice, uh, be dealing with uh, in, in the immigration sphere. 
um, at the more low level that I deal with. Um, I'm three years, uh, just about three years cool now. Um, and I have, as part of the Baby Barrister Scheme, um, been involved in preparing um, summary grounds of resistance in immigration cases. So this will normally, normally be challenges to um, a uh, refusal of right to remain, for example, or leave to enter. Um, as a baby barrister, you'll deal with the less complex cases for obvious reasons. You're, you're not terribly uh, experienced in that area of law, but it's an opportunity to sort of get yourself um, exposed to uh, immigration as an area of law, uh, an area which is um, very, very uh, fast changing. Uh, and uh, it's a fantastic opportunity to kind of get some exposure to judicial review, which um, ordinarily, because of the panel system, you'll be about three years into your practice before you'll be eligible to apply for the uh, what's now the Government Legal uh, Department panel. Um, the other area that we deal with predominantly is, is that of policing, um, that being that we, we represent a lot of um, police forces at Five Essex Court. Um, and uh, one of the most recent challenges of, that was um, uh, in the Supreme Court uh, just last year, a judgment given in December, um, concerned the stop and search powers um, under uh, Section 60 of the Criminal Justice Crime uh, and Order Act. And that was a challenge to the exercise of those powers um, and whether or not uh, they constituted an, uh, an unjustified interference with Article 8 rights, whether or not they were discriminatory under Article 14, and whether they were um, an arbitrary uh, detention under Article 5. So um, that was an extremely interesting case. Ultimately, the Supreme Court determined um, because they were only looking at whether or not um, it, the powers were in accordance with the law for the purposes of Article 8, uh, and they ultimately held that they were. Um, but that was a case which um, one of our silks and junior um, represented the commissioner on in the Supreme Court. So that just gives you a flavour of what, um, again, you know, the, the, the very sort of juicy, interesting cases that go right the way up to um, at the highest court that we have, um, albeit that it might well go on to Strasbourg. We don't yet know uh, whether or not it will be appealed further. Um, in terms of what I find um, particularly appealing about this practice area, I've already talked about the, um, I suppose, what might be the intellectual stimulation. Um, but in terms of the sort of substantive um, side of it, um, in my view, uh, you're very much at the heart of this um, balance of power between the different organs uh, of the state. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, public law is concerned with what types of decisions are justiciable as well as uh, in what circumstances the government will be afforded a margin of appreciation. Uh, and similarly, the courts, as you know, uh, having studied human rights law, will be regularly asked either uh, to uh, adopt a rather strained construction for the purposes of human rights compliance, or alternatively to give a declaration of incompatibility. And so there is that constant uh, tension between the what the judiciary are being asked to do and the constraints that they are being asked to place either on the executive or, or indeed to a certain extent on what Parliament uh, has decided to enact in primary legislation. Um, and I think what's more, what underlines a lot of public law is a much more philosophical debate about um, what type of society we want to live in, whether or not um, we uh, want to give primacy to individual autonomy and what constraints we place on that individual autonomy uh, in the interests of wider society. Um, and that plays out constantly in the legal arguments that you might have about balancing convention rights, for example, uh, particularly under Article 8. It's not an absolute right. It has to, uh, at times, uh, be constrained in the interests of, of wider society. So th there is that constant tension um, there. Um, and in terms of the procedural side of public law, it's a very fast-paced area of law. You'll be aware the time frames are much shorter than in other areas of practice. Um, you've only got three months within which to challenge a, a decision, uh, and that means a very short pre-action period uh, of around 14 days. Um, and, uh, and also, because you don't have a lengthy disclosure, for example, albeit there's a duty of candour on government bodies, um, you don't have the type of disclosure exercise that you have in um, other types of civil action. Um, so it makes for a very quick-paced uh, type of claim. Uh, and a quick turnaround, and that's quite satisfying as well because you have decisions within a short time frame. Um, the permission hurdle means that quite often um, a challenge will stop very abruptly uh, at the permission stage, assuming that they don't um, seek an oral hearing uh, to uh, challenge that. Um, in terms of the uh, lifestyle implications, I think that because of that short time frame that you're dealing with, 
um, unlike uh, perhaps commercial areas of the bar, you don't have the luxury um, of time very often. Uh, normally you've got um, a matter of days rather than a matter of weeks uh, in which to um, prepare your um, <coughs> pleadings and so um, to that extent you need to be prepared at pretty short notice to get to grips with um, sometimes relatively new areas of law or otherwise to refresh your knowledge of an area that you've already um, uh, dealt with or covered um, and so as I say that makes it exciting but it's also challenging um, that can be stressful so that's something to bear in mind um, albeit in my view it's very much worth uh, <laughs> worth worthwhile um, and in terms of the types of skills that you, I think, would need in public law, um, I suppose, as I've covered initially, um, because it's a type of advocacy that is much more focused on legal argument, um, you've really got to be um, prepared to kind of get to grips uh, with your case law. Um, it's very much a, a legal analysis um, rather than, uh, as I said before, jury advocacy. So that, that's very much the focus of your style as an advocate, in, in my view. Um, and, uh, and as I say, you know, to be pretty flexible uh, and to pick up things at short notice. My name is Charles Streeton and I am the most junior tenant at Francis Taylor Building, so I've been in practice for all of about five months, I think. Uh, and and in, in true barrister style, I'm going to make three points. I'm going to look at what public law is. And I'm going to look at what it's like to practice public law at FTB because I think, as Katrina said, all of us have quite different practices. Uh, and then finally, I'll try and talk about how to get a public law pupillage if we haven't put you off by the time you leave the room. So dealing in, in very broad brush terms with what public law is, I think uh, it covers a multitude of sins. And whilst the mothership is the administrative court and that judicial review advocacy that Katrina was talking about. There's a whole series of satellite fields, humanitarian law, inquests for us, planning inquiries, um, police cases that kind of form their way off that central public law body that, that arises from the administrative court. But uh, in, ter in terms of what is public law, I think it's really all about uh, the powers, duties on public authorities and the rights of the individual in the face of those powers and duties, or, or put in, in layman's terms, what can the government, be it local or national, do, uh, and uh, what is it required to do to look after me as well. And uh, the range of context in which that comes up, I, th I think, is, is quite vast, from the big human rights constitutional challenges that Catriona mentioned, where Article 8 are in play, or cases like Jackson, which was about the Hunting Act, and whether or not um, the Parliament Acts 2000 and, not 2000, uh, 1911 and uh, 1949 were constitutionally signed right down to appearances in magistrates' courts where you're asking for an ASBO or a public spaces protection order or a closure order or something like that um, to be made or varied or, or lifted. So at least from, from where my practice sits, I have half of my time sitting behind very eminent silks making very, very clever, very complicated legal arguments that I've tried to help them draft in the library, and half of my time arguing not particularly legal cases, but often that have quite a, a factually interesting background. And I think if you're deciding to apply for public law pupillage, what you need to do is think about the sort of facts that you would like to be involved in. So if you want to do big human rights humanitarian cases, then you probably want to go to somewhere like Matrix or Doughty Street. Um, if you want to do police work, then you want to go to Five Essex. And if you want to deal with land use issues, um, environmental law, then I think perhaps we're the place to, to come to. So turning then on to my second point and what we do at FTB. Our, our core practice relates to public law and, and land effectively. So a lot of it is planning uh, or environment, and then we have a sideline in licensing, which is all about nightclubs and restaurants and sex shops and anything else that you need a license for. And it's actually some of the more fun work, at least at the junior end, because you find yourself acting for bougies or somewhere like that. Um, and, then, and then our big headline cases are these huge infrastructure projects that run for years and years. So uh, the HS2 bill in Parliament, members of chambers are both promoting and objecting to, um, members of chambers act for Heathrow, for the big power stations, new roads, railways, you name it, that's where the, the real serious money is, is made, I think. But uh, in terms of what it's like at the junior end, I thought I'd talk about 
three of my own cases in, in a, a, a truly um, self-indulgent way. And, and the first of those uh, was a case that I started doing when I was in pupillage. Uh, the client, I think, didn't particularly want to pay for an expensive junior and was therefore prepared to accept a pupil as a junior on the case. Um, and we argued it before the High Court for two days, and it was uh, all about whether our client, then called Lafarge, now bought out by Tarmac, um, when they were restoring a big quarry in Yorkshire, had to have the, the, the refuse used to restore that quarry to turn it into a wetland classified uh, as landfill or as recovery, which effectively means a recycled material, and there are regulatory and financial consequences that stem from that classification. So two days spent um, arguing what we thought was an excellent point of European law in the High Court and, and a resounding no from Mrs Justice Patterson. But um, because there was a, a planning condition in place and because we said, well, we're going to find ourselves liable to restore this and we really think we're right, we applied to the Court of Appeal uh, for leave, they expedited us, and um, before I was two months into tenancy, I was sitting behind Greg Jones QC in the Court of Appeal, arguing what we thought was a very good point of European law, and uh, Lord Justice Sales agreed with us that it was a good point of European law, um, and we won, and that was a hugely satisfying experience as the most baby person in, in the whole of Chambers to have just done this case that, at least it seemed to me, um, had, had really made uh, a difference, albeit financial and, and to a very large company. Um, uh, the second case I'm going to talk about, I think hopefully the difference it's made is, uh, or rather may make, is, is more uh, so socially acceptable uh, in that it, it's acting for a group, or rather for an individual who's a member of a pressure group uh, up in Sheffield. Uh, and in Sheffield they have, uh, I gather, the greenest city in the United Kingdom, if not in Europe, and there are a lot of very beautiful street trees there, um, which the City Council have, um, under a private finance initiative contract, uh, been cutting down, they say, for lawful reasons, and we say, um, perhaps not for lawful reasons, and I um, was instructed very, very late notice by, um, by this, this lay client who said, look, I want to do something about it, I can crowdfund it, I can get £10,000 together through the internet. In environmental law, you can get a cost protection order, so that's the sum total of his, uh, his liability. I did it on a CFA, and the long and the short of it was, 24 hours later, we had an interim injunction without an undertaking in damages, preventing them from cutting down any more trees. Um, I'm now, at the end of this month, going to be appearing in the High Court on my own, uh, at a full rolled-up hearing, uh, on that case because I think the other side have got slightly worried and, and, and want, it, want it heard properly. And that, I think, for a junior barrister, again, is a, a terrifying but exciting experience. And in that instance, it does, it does mean a huge amount to my client. He really is very passionate about the trees. It's caused a whole load of public outcry up in Sheffield. Uh, Nick Clegg weighed in and um, said helpful or unhelpful things, depending on which side of the fence you sit. Um, and, then, and then finally, I thought I'd, I'd take it right down to to my more day-to-day -day practice, because those cases are very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, and I find uh, that once a week I actually, or more or less once a week, I act for the police, which is not normal work for Chambers, but stemming out of our um, licensing practice, we do work for the police, and I did a bit for them, and now I find that they regularly instruct me on these closure orders, which are where you turn up to the magistrate's court and you say that a given premises has been associated with um, either disorder or nuisance or crime, and that you need to make an order making it a criminal offence to go into those premises for three months. And they cut, the police will come along if you get the order uh, and put a metal door on, board it up, and no one could go in. So it's, a, as well, I see it, a relatively draconian measure, uh, and it very clearly does interfere with the individual's Article 8 rights, and I turn up um, for the good guy or the bad guy uh, and, and try and get a, a closure order preventing someone going into their home the next day. And that's exposed me to an entirely different world from the relatively commercial, rarefied world of planning where what you're dealing with are huge developments of thousands of houses and suddenly what I'm dealing with are, are drug dealers and pubs that have had a series of murders in and I, I cross-examined in Wolverhampton on whether or not it was reasonable that five people had been stabbed in someone's pub. <laughs> and that, that is a, a long way from home for most administrative lawyers, but it does show the breadth of public law practice at the junior end and, and what you can actually be involved in. And it's a great opportunity for us to do witness handling. So 
I think there is, there is a lot that you can actually do in public law, and it's not, it's not just the administrative court, albeit that uh, that is the natural home, perhaps, of the administrative lawyer. So the, the hardest question of all is, is how does one get there? And I, I think, for me, I found myself slightly surprised that I have, and I'm sure that's the case for most people. You just land on your feet um, where you land. I did know that I wanted to do administrative law, and I did know that I really wanted it to be about um, the environment, in particular the built environment, and and what the place I, I live in looks like. And I suppose when you're turning up to a, a pupillage interview, what you need to do is think, what does this set want from me? What are their criteria? And to do your best to explain to them why you meet those criteria, not just better, but perhaps in a slightly different way from everyone else, because there are a huge number of very well-qualified applicants. And if you can be the one who's a little bit different, then you might well be the one who sticks in the mind of your panel. So to go for my final tricolon and then I'll be quiet, um, the three things that I think panels will look for, um, albeit trite, is intellect, advocacy and commitment to the profession. And if you can come up with a different way to show those from everybody else, then you will be in the best possible position. So the likelihood is that everyone will have a good degree and the better your degree is, the better. But if you can show a way that that you're interested in the law that goes beyond just being academically clever, but being passionate about it, say, writing an article, um, or, or even just reading widely about it and having a different take on a case, you know, enjoying a dissenting judgment and being prepared to say, you know what, I think Lord Newberger was wrong. I think that will go quite a long way with a panel uh, to show that you're not just repeating, Pat, what you were told in your BPTC or, or law lecture classes. Uh, the second of my points was advocacy. And I think when you deal with advocacy, it's very easy just to say, I am a good advocate because I have spoken in public a lot. Um, but that's not really going to cut the mustard because most people who apply for pupillage will have done that. So what I'd advise you to do is think about what advocacy actually is. What does it mean to be an advocate? And I did a classics degree, so to take a, a classical approach, to it is the words advoco. It's, it's talking to someone and it's the ability to change the way you talk to someone depending on the context. So as Caccione was saying, when you're in the administrative court, you've probably got a day, a day and a half, maximum two days, and it's bang, 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 these are my points. If you're doing a planning inquiry for five months, then you're working very steadily through very complicated material, and you need to be able to say, well, yes, on the one hand, I'm capable of making my three to five points, and on the other, I'm capable of finessing out a, a technical legal argument. And then, finally, commitment. And I think that's probably normally the deciding factor. It's does this person really want it? But it's also uh, the hardest thing to show. And I suppose, in my, in my opinion, the easiest way for you to show that is, is likely to be to do some extracurricular work experience. And I don't just mean mini pupillages. If you want to do planning, go and work at a local authority. Go and spend some time with Greenpeace. If you want to do humanitarian and letterian law, try and go and do something at the UN. If you look at the CVs of the people who are at Matrix or Doughty, almost all of them have got international humanitarian experience. So take the time to get behind the client and, and see what it's like. Uh, and I think if you can do that, um, we'd certainly be very happy if you were knocking on our door. What Charles hasn't told you about his practice is the sex shop cases have all the best names. Um, the, the Northern Irish case of misbehaving. Um, and there's one at the moment, which is the Queen on the application of Simply Pleasure. Limited, which is at the Supreme Court and has gone off to Europe. Um, doing a talk like this is a bit like Groundhog Day by the time you get to the third and fourth <laughs> speakers. And my talk's going to be an extended variation of what you've already heard. Um, so sorry about that. Um, in terms of why I wanted to be a barrister, um, Catriona has talked about the responsibility of determining you know, the proper arguments and proper cases. Mine was essentially a rather shallower version of that. I don't like being told what to do. Um, and I like, essentially, the freedom to determine um, my own practice, which is part of the freedom you get uh, from being self-employed. If, okay, if Within the bounds of the cab rank rule, if cases interest you, you can take them. Um, if you have other commitments, if you have other interests, if you have academic interests, you can do those along the same, you know, at the same time. Um, you have an awful lot of freedom to determine your work-life balance, albeit that's the case in principle, I think, for most barristers, the work-life balance is slanted rather more towards the work. Um, so perhaps it's more illusory than 
um, actual. In terms of uh, public law, the thing which really attracted me to public law, again, something we've already heard in part, um, is the interrelationship with politics. Um, public law, as um, Charles has said, Catriona has said, it's really about the interaction between government and the citizen, the rules regulating the internal relations of government and its external relations. Um, and that means, inevitably, that it's bound up with the political system and it's bound up with the constitution of this country, which, being unwritten, is malleable. And what the government does changes um, the constitution to an extent. Parliament, the executive, the courts are all in a sort of symbiotic relationship where their actions affect each other. Part of that, as Catriona was saying, is that standards of review, standards of legal review, are politically influential. If the courts take an intrusive approach to executive decision making, or if, as they can do under European law, they strike down an act of parliament, so for example, um, the investigatory powers bills before parliament at the moment, um, one thing that does is replace an act called DRIPA, Data Retention Investigatory Powers Act. That act was struck down by the divisional court on the basis that it interfered with European law. Went to, went to the Court of Appeal, unsurprisingly, um, hard to strike down acts of parliament, um, and the Court of Appeal have said, hang on a minute, let's send this off to Europe and see what they think. Um, but there, there is a real impact that public law has on the constitutional and political arrangements of this country. Um, so that was what I found particularly interesting about it. One of the things I did straight after pupillage was go off to the Supreme Court um, and spend a year there. And just in terms of the politically influential cases we had in that year, um, we had a case about a woman called Lindsay Sandiford, who was on death row in Indonesia, um, whether the British government could be required to provide funding, uh, effectively legal aid funding, for her appeals against her conviction for drug trafficking. The Supreme Court said no. Um, case brought by Lord Carlyle, an influential member of the House of Lords, um, because he and various other parliamentarians had invited a, an Iranian um, free speech activist to give a talk in Parliament, and the British government had um, banned her from entering the country, essentially on the basis that the Iranians would kick off um, if they were brought in, and it was a politically sensitive time. Again, the Supreme Court said no. In, I think, both of those cases, one judge, Lord Kerr, dissented, essentially on the basis that he felt the court should intervene in this situation, the other justices didn't. Again, the standards of review potentially having a significant political impact. Similarly, case about the bedroom tax that year, case about the benefit cap that year, whether they were discriminatory under EU law in relation to women and domestic abuse victims and similar. And as we've already heard, HS2, part of the HS2 litigation, uh, went to the Supreme Court that year concerned with whether um, the Act of Parliament, the way that HS2 was taken through Parliament contravened European law. And that was just one year, and that was the cases that got to the Supreme Court. So th 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 there is an enormous amount of politically interesting, politically controversial judicial decision-making. And in that context, the legal questions, the case law questions, how intensive should the scrutiny be, are not only really interesting from an academic perspective, but they're also um, very potentially important in terms of their consequences. The other reason which I find it interesting is the interaction of different areas of law. Um, now, this is true almost anywhere. It, there are now relatively few areas of law in which the ECHR can't play a role, the EU can't play a role. With that said, a great proportion of um, administrative law cases, public law cases, involve a complex interplay of judicial decisions. It's probably the area where more of the law is judge-made. Well, no, crime, crime possibly. Crime and negligence are probably the other ones. Um, but it, it is one of the areas where a great proportion of the law is purely judge-made, standards of judicial review derived from judicial decisions, not from statute. But there is a massive legislative corpus applying to regulate the authorities of public bodies, sorry, the activities of public bodies, particularly local authorities, but all over the place. And statutory interpretation is a big part of it, as mediated through judicial decisions. EU law, I mean, we've all talked about EU law, which is probably a good indication of 
um, its relevance and importance, and the Human Rights Act and the ECHR through that. And actually, it goes even further than that. Um, Charles mentioned protective costs orders in environmental claims. That's from something called the Aarhus Convention, um, which is a treaty which comes into our law through European law, but isn't actually an EU treaty itself. So you get this complex interplay of the legal framework, um, which is intellectually and academically very interesting. You've already heard quite a bit about the different areas of law that make up public law and how varied it is. Um, in terms, some of it's a lot of what Charles talked about, for example, it, it, commercial decisions, that, that those aren't limited to the planning context. One has also a lot of regulatory um, public law to do with Ofcom, other regulators, awful lot of European law in that area. Also has things like procurement, which I do a fair bit of, which is the, the decisions made by government bodies subject to EU regulation when they're buying goods and services. Um, one has ca cases involving individuals, like immigration and police cases. One also has the big policy challenges. So one of the things I did when I'd just come back to Chambers after the Supreme Court was the challenge to um, Grayling's legal aid uh, reforms, quote unquote, um, for um, criminal legal aid lawyers. Um, that was a pretty big challenge to a pretty big government policy. Irritatingly, we lost, and we lost in the Court of Appeal, unlike Charles, but um, Gove has at least scrapped it, so I sort of feel justified, even if it's a year too late. Um, that case is quite a good example of the lifestyle. It's absolutely right that um, there are short turnaround times. It really varies depending on the area, how big the case is. Quite often you have to issue quite fast, but then the actual process of bringing the case on for hearing may be a bit slower. But for example, a decision like the legal aid tender decision, um, the law firms that were subject to it were going to have to enter the tendering process straight away. Um, and so the challenge was hugely expedited. To give you an idea, we, um, we were instructed on the 12th of December. Um, we issued on the 19th with an application for an injunction to hold the whole process up. We got a decision back from the admin court the same day saying, no, you can't have an injunction, but we can, we'll hear this in the middle of January. So there, there won't be that much detriment. Uh, we, that was a Friday. We considered our position over the weekend. Um, we decided this isn't good enough. We're going to go for the um, injunction. We've been given a 48-hour return date, so we had to give 48 hours notice if we wanted to go to court. Um, we didn't want to go to court. We told them on the 22nd, and we said, sorry, there's a 48-hour return date. We'll see you on Christmas Eve. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, well, fortunately, as it turned out, the admin court um, uh, said, well, we're not open on Christmas Eve, um, so we're, not, we're going to ignore the 48-hour return date and we'll, we'll see you tomorrow morning, um, which uh, they did. We, we didn't get a whole lot of sleep, but uh, we got our injunction, and a lot of the criminal legal aid lawyers were quite happy because they got their Christmas back. So um, it, it, it can be very snappy turnarounds. It, it can be slightly slower. In terms of the key skills, I'm not sure, oh, am I, we running out of time? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Onwards. I would like to be able to pick up directly where we've left off, um, but unfortunately I think I'll have to take a quick step back. I thought given what we'd heard from the other speakers, it might be most useful um, to speak from a personal perspective as a current trainee at Matrix Chambers, um, a little bit about how and why I ended up where I am. As you can probably hear, I came through the Australian system rather than the English one. Um, the kind of work that I'm doing at the moment um, and why I would very heartily recommend it. Um, so in Australia you tend to do an undergraduate law degree with another degree, which in my case was politics. Um, and my real motivation going into both of those degrees was to try to work out a way that I could, inverted commas, make a difference, um, which is something that might resonate with a lot of you who are interested in public law. I think it's, it's quite a common set of motivations. Um, I was quite lucky. In Australia our undergrad law degrees are very practical. Um, and a lot of people, after about three years of contract taught civil procedure, think, why on earth did I do this? I really don't like it very much. I was very lucky in that I discovered at about the third year mark that I really enjoyed it very much indeed. Um, and then it became a question for me in my final two years, because a double degree takes about five years, um, of trying to work out how I could use my legal qualifications to continue to make the kind of changes that I wanted to be a part of. Um, my first step was to get the best training that I could find in Australia and so as well as doing some 
internships with the UN. I spent a year as an associate at the federal court, um, and then I went and did um, about six to eight months at a commercial law firm um, as a solicitor in um, litigation. I then went off to Oxford to do the BCL and the MPhil, and that was where I really wanted to take some time to specialise in public law and human rights. Um, and in particular, I did a lot of refugee law and a lot of international humanitarian law, which as you may know is kind of the law of war as opposed to the law of peace. Um, it was during my MPhil year that I really focused on making all of my job applications, including going through the process that you are probably all either going through or thinking about going through of applying for pupillages, um, which we at Matrix call traineeships. It was a really intense process and what I would say about it is to prepare extremely carefully for your interviews um, and to be aware that you are heading into a bit of a roller coaster of a month or so, probably a couple of months, um, and that it's incredibly intellectually uh, and emotionally draining and an awful lot of fun. And you will come out of it a much better interviewee than you went into it. And so I feel like even if I hadn't gotten any, any jobs out of it, I would have really valued the experience um, I had never prepped for interviews prior to that. I'd always thought it was fine to wing it. Uh, I'd advise you not to. It's a very gruelling process and it's absolutely worth your while to practice to the mirror, uh, your mother, your cat, whoever's prepared to listen. Um, so as part of that process, I, I ended up with both a traineeship at Matrix um, and a one-year traineeship with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, um, which filled the gap between the end of my MPhil and the start of traineeship. And what that let me do uh, was to come back to Matrix, being able to say quite confidently that I wanted to continue to practice in the kind of areas of law that I had been studying and working in for, by that time, the previous three years. Um, Matrix is brilliant and they very kindly organised me two seats in public law and human rights, uh, one which I'm currently doing in media and information law and one in employment law. You've probably gathered already from what's been said that public law is immensely broad and broader even than I kind of would have thought coming in. Everything from immigration to education to tax to privacy to planning. Um, and so the fact that you're interested in it still allows you an enormous amount of wiggle room to work out where your serious interests lie. Um, the interesting thing for me about the human rights element of it is that there are absolutely kind of pure human rights cases, but human rights issues come up in an equally immensely broad variety of claims. And that's certainly been reflected in my experience so far at Matrix. Um, and I've been on matters that have involved equality law, data protection, uh, IHL, those kind of pure human rights claims. And yes, even tax law, which was a lot more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Um, what I like about public law is that there seems to be the opportunity to really specialise in one or more areas, but that there is a certain amount of bread that's very valuable. And one of the things that I like about it is that often, particularly when you're kind of doing your classic judicial review claims, you're applying quite a familiar uh, legal framework, if you like, to a novel set of facts and then a novel set of kind of legal details. And so while, you know, you might be in new waters every time, you're never completely at sea, and it's that tension that I find really engaging. Um, for me, it's also, as I said, about finding a practice area where I feel like I can continue to, inverted commas, make a difference, um, whether that's by holding the government to account when they make decisions that impact on people's rights or ensuring that totally reasonable policies are properly and lawfully implemented. I very much hope that I'll be able to stay on at Matrix um, and I hope that by continuing to work in this area I'll be able to, I will have found the way to combine law with change making in the way that I've always hoped to. I've had an amazing experience so far, I'm now halfway through um, and for those of you who are going into the pupillage traineeship application process, um, I wish you every success because as I said, it's a roller coaster, but it's a really, really fun one and it's absolutely worth getting on. <laughs>